Today we're talking about formants. Formants arise when a signal is shaped by our resonant body. So, for example, a room or an acoustic instrument or a vocal tract. The resonant body amplifies and attenuates certain frequency ranges, creating fixed resonant peaks. While most are generally in agreement on what formants are, it's hard to find a strict definition that's actionable from an analytical standpoint. Some define formants as global or local maximums in the frequency amplitude curve for a signal. So using that definition, this peak would be a formant. This definition is useful if you want to quickly eyeball the location of a formant, but it's not very precise. If you play a note and then another nearby note, you might find that your formant moves. Or if you play a note that's above your measured formant frequency, you'll find that there's no maximum at that frequency, even though the resonant body should still boost frequencies in that range. For a more precise definition, we'll have to make an abstraction. So here's the definition we'll be using. See if you can spot it. A formant is a peak in a spectral envelope. A spectral envelope is a frequency amplitude curve. Normally when we discuss envelopes, it's some value in relation to time. But a spectral envelope is the amplitude in relation to frequency. We've already been introduced to a basic version of this concept in the form of filters. Filters affect your amplitude, but the magnitude of the effect depends on the frequency being affected. In real acoustic spaces, the spectral envelopes can be much more complicated. Instead of a simple roll-off with a single resonant peak, we'll often have multiple peaks and dips, each with their own width and gain. Think of how your voice sounds in different rooms. Even with the mitigating factor of bone conduction, you'll still notice a difference in the reverberations. These differences are a result of the room's resonant properties. For an extreme demonstration of this, check out Alvin Lucier's I Am Sitting in a Room. Lucier records a bit of dialogue and then plays it through a loudspeaker into a space. He re-records the resulting reverberations and then plays that back into the space. He continues this process recursively, reinforcing the amplification and attenuation of the room's spectral envelope. In the end, all that remains are the room's resonances. But this concept doesn't only apply to rooms. Acoustic instruments, so percussion, strings, brass, wind, all have their own spectral envelopes that affect their sound. To calculate these envelopes, you can use the sine sweep method. Play a simple sine wave into the resonant body and then sweep the frequency of the sine wave. Measure the resulting sound pressure levels and graph the amplitudes in relation to frequency. Once you have the spectral envelope measured, you can recreate it with a parametric EQ and use it to model the resonant properties of the space. With this in mind, let's try to model the world's most common instrument, the human voice. In contrast to our two definitions from before, there's a third definition of formant that's specific to the human voice. These are the frequencies amplified by the two main resonant cavities of the vocal tract. The first resonator, which creates a lower formant, is between the larynx and the tongue. The upper formant is created by the second cavity above the tongue. Through maneuvering these two resonators, we shape the formants that create human speech. As before, we can recreate these formants using parametric EQs. Here are some vowel sounds using this method. To create these, I'm using a sawtooth and noise, with a parametric EQ emphasizing the formants. With some careful patching, you can even automate the EQ parameters to shift between vowels. This might seem like a lot of effort when we could just use a vocal sample. But remember, formants are fixed. As we move between notes, the formants stay the same. If we use a sample, as we move between notes, the formants move as well. This is why pitch shifted vocals tend to sound unnatural. This is why pitch shifted vocals tend to sound unnatural. Luckily, a lot of music production software gives us tools to correct this. Often you can preserve the formant so you can change pitch without changing the quality of the voice. Or you can shift the formant to change the quality of the voice without changing the pitch. So yes, you can absolutely use a sample instead. But for the best results, it helps to know the how and the why. And even with that in mind, there are times where one method is clearly preferable. If you have a recording of a voice and just want a simple pitch shift or formant shift, there's no reason to get a parametric EQ involved. But with synthesis, you can create totally custom formants. 
the avenues of experimentation are completely different, and so is the range of potential sounds. Which isn't to say that one method is better than the other. In synthesis, if you have two different approaches, the best option is always to try both. If you like this episode and want bonus tutorials and one-on-one synth lessons, support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash thatbeat. This has been Synth Fundamentals. Thanks for watching.